Well, good morning, Lifeway family. Before I jump into the message, I do believe um, I have a responsibility to just relay the significance of this morning. It's after Easter. It's been 50 days. Today is Pentecost Sunday. The believers that were waiting in the upper room were receiving the promise that Jesus had told them about nonstop since the time he showed up on the scene. And so I do believe that there's a special impartation that the Holy Spirit wants to release today in this place, and I cannot wait to get to it. So let's jump right in today. The title of this message is, Why Worship? Why Worship? I mean, what a title. So many reasons to mention, but I'll start by saying this. With the exception of salvation, nothing can change your life as profoundly as worship. I'll say that again. With the exception of salvation, nothing can change your life as profoundly as worship. Salvation's first because it is eternal. That's a long time. You got to know for certain that whenever you stand before the throne, you make sure your name is on the book of life, right? That's first. But after salvation, nothing can change you like worship. And here's why. Because worshiping the king of kings is transplanting you from your current seat or your closet or wherever you may be into his environment. You have access to this place 24-7. So we're in prayer this morning, 8 a.m., and my phone goes off, right? I'm a little annoyed. I check it. This guy texts me and said, I can't get into the gym. Your doors aren't working. I say, okay. So I check it out. I pull up my stuff. My doors are fine. He just hadn't paid me yet. So his membership was shut off. The door was good, but he didn't pay the fee necessary to have access to get through where he wanted to go. Today, I've got to relay this message to you that you don't have to pay a thing, but you've just got to receive the love of the Father. It will require a step. It might be a step of uncomfortableness, but if you'll push through that, Holy Spirit has an environment for you that's so rich, so filling, you won't go another day without experiencing it. Now, I want to establish this point very early on. Because everything else in this word is going to stem from this point. So write this down. Worship brings you into the presence of God. Worship brings you to the presence of God. I do believe that this morning there will be those of you who step into the courts fully for the first time in your lives. And others of you here who have been worshiping for years, decades, and further than that. There's a new step he will take you in today. Right? Because we're never done growing. There's always a new step. There's always something new. God's so great like that. We can never understand or grasp just how great he is. It's always new. He's the God of the new. And this leads me right into the first scripture, Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. And so two weeks ago, Pastor Tanya preached, and she brought this amazing word, and she used this verse in there where she says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so I have a challenge for you this morning. I want you to hear the word of God. I don't want you just to audibly to listen. I want your other senses heightened. Can we feel the text? Can we see the text? Drake Jones, thank you for making me the gate. I needed a visual. Can we see it? We enter his gates with thankfulness. How amazing is that? God says to get into my gates, all you have to do is take notice of who I am. Because when you notice his nature, thankfulness bursts from your heart, does it not? Thank you, Jesus, for my family, for your love, everything he's given to me, right? To get into the gate, I just have to be thankful. We're okay with that. We're very thankful as a church, as a society. And hold, do we not pray and thank God for every meal that we eat? Even if you're hungry and it sounds like, Jesus, thank you for this food, amen, right? You say... Thank you. We're thankful. But it's the next step of the unknown to get you to the courts. I believe that for far too long we've been content with staying in the gate, but it's the life transformation of the courts that can completely change your life. There's something new today, and it's to require a new step from you. As I was writing this message, I was having a hard time Piecing together, how, Father, can I adequately describe what takes place in your courts? And then I realized that I can't. Some things in life are only realized through experience. Pastor Terry pops over here. He loves In-N-Out. He loves In-N-Out cheeseburgers, double-double animal style, right? Large chocolate shake. He's going to Texas today. He's probably going to stop by In-N-Out now that I've said this. Why does he want one? Because he's tasted one before. He's, he knows what it's like. Raise your hand if you've never been to In-N-Out. Is there anyone here? Poor people. 
We have a responsibility, church, to get these brothers and sisters of Christ to an in and out soon, okay? The bottom of the cup says John 3, 16. I'm not kidding. Look at it next time you're there. It's great food. I noticed my brother Thomas raised his hand. Thomas cannot long for this place like Pastor Terry can simply because Pastor Terry has experienced it and Thomas hasn't. How can you miss something you never experienced? I believe that we can come to church for a long time because this was me personally. I loved God. I was devoted. I was here. I was even reading the word. But because I had never experienced the courts of the Father, I was unable to grasp what I was missing out on. And today I just want to release a hunger. Father, put a hunger over the congregation to experience your courts. If you could, close your eyes. Jesus is releasing a hunger, a desire. It's something that you're not aware of yet, but the Father is going to make it very real to you in this place. Father, give us a desire, a craving that it can't stop until we experience your courts. It's your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Man. So here's how it worked in my life. We often seek God for help, right? But there's nothing wrong with this. If you're hurting, you should seek the healer, right? If you're stressed out, you should seek the great counselor. If you're hurting financially, seek your provider. And all too often, we treat worship as this avenue to receive something from God. But the moment my worship shifted because I was broken and I just needed to discover his heart, it changed everything. So come to this place in worship where I'm not seeking his hand for help, but I just need to be in your courts because that changes everything in your life. Check this out. Psalm 84 verse 10. It says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. What I have discovered is that there are two types of people in the world. There are beach people. If you like going to the beach, put your hand up. Where's my beach people at? Yes, I get you. I relate. Now there's mountain people too. Who's a mountain person? There's two types. The mountain people are a little more country and they're louder, right? <laughs> and so the point is not to argue what's a better place because we're all different. We all have that environment that we like. But this scripture is, is very weighty. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. Think of that place that you love so much. Maybe you have a specific mountain town that you just love to go to. It's perfect. You love it. Better is one day in his courts, in your closet, in your home, than a thousand days of that perfect environment. This is something that's hard to grasp if you've never fully been into the courts. Who has access to the courts then? Right? What a place. Better is one day in that environment than a thousand of the perfect place. Who would have access to this place? Well, if we're looking at the word of God through the Old Testament, only the high priest had access into the courts of God. And only then... Could he enter the Holy of Holies one time a year? But through new covenant living, through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ, he has made a way for you, an access point, you could say, into his presence 24-7. Check this out. Ephesians 3.12. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. So good. My prayer this entire week has been that everyone here would experience the courts of God at the end of the service today. Some of us for the first time, others for the hundredth. His courts and his presence is something that has always been available to us, right? Because of the cross, we have had access to it. But for so many years, for me, it was like I had access, but I didn't know how to make my key fit into the door. And so I just settled with being inside the gate. There's nothing that you have to do to work for it. You don't have to have everything figured out. In Revelations, Jesus says, I defeated the death and grave. And look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys. He holds the keys. And so that guy that was locked out of the gym because he didn't pay, you don't have any keys. That gate just swings open, and you have access to walk into it. You don't have to work for it. He's so good like that. He's such a loving father. But because I misunderstood what it took, I was unable to get to where I needed to be. Have you ever been misunderstood? Being misunderstood is hard. I think in 2021, it's super easy through a text message, right? Because people apply a tone of voice to a text, and it's really bad with your kids. If you have kids and you text your children, I would say anywhere from like the eight to 16 year old range, or even my parents sometimes, I'll text them, and there's a little bit, if there's sometimes they don't understand, right? I'm texting my son, I'm like, hey, I got football cards. And he goes, are you capping me? What do you, 
I don't understand. He says, no caps. I'm like, I don't understand still. Um, there's this language barrier. There's a mis- misunderstanding. It's hard because two people are impacted, right? I am misunderstanding my son, so I'm not really knowing what he's saying. And then he's impacted because he doesn't know what dad's thinking. Two people are affected by misunderstandings. Could we have just misunderstood what the father's wanting? Ryan Stitt and I were talking about this two weeks ago. We're going through the Gospel of Matthew. And we're like, man, how frustrated must Jesus have been? Like, he's misunderstood all the time, even to the people who are closest to him. The disciples ask him, teacher, what is the kingdom of heaven like? And he says it's like this mustard seed, and he explains, and they don't understand. The Pharisees couldn't fathom his audacity. He heals on the Sabbath. What's he doing? They didn't understand Jesus came to make a relational bridge from our point to the Father, not to keep a bunch of rules. They don't understand him. Nicodemus sees Jesus and says, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus tells him he must be born again. Nicodemus says, must I crawl back into my mother's womb? He doesn't get it. He's misunderstood even by the ones that he loved. Remember when he went to see Lazarus and he sees his sister Martha crying and he says, your brother will rise again. And she says, yes, one day we will all rise again. She couldn't fathom that in that moment, Jesus is God in flesh. And so if he says, move, the mountain moves. If he says, get up and walk, he's coming out of that grave, right? Grave clothes on and all. He's coming out because when Jesus speaks, it is real. He breathed your very existence with his mouth. He's all powerful, unstoppable. He's perceived as distant, but he's always present. This right here is viewed by most people as a rule book. But really, it's just a relational piece. He just wants my heart. He's viewed as somebody who sits in heaven and wants worship. But really, he just wants you. God does not want, nor does he need your worship, but he does long for the worshiper. He wants all of you. He doesn't need to be told he's so good through my words. Yes, that is my natural response because he is. But if I'm just proclaiming his goodness, but my heart is not reflecting the power of the words coming from my mouth then I'm not being pulled into his courts. I'm just reciting something. And we're not knocking today. I think that we come to church and I think that we are genuinely giving God what we think that he wants. We could stand and respect and we could sing the songs. But the Father, God, is wanting you to express your feelings and not the facts. He knows the facts. He's always good. He is unstoppable. There's no mountain he wouldn't climb up. No shadow, he won't light up. He's coming after you. But if that feeling is not expressed, then I'm just telling him the facts of his nature, and that is just getting into the gates. Thank you. But he wants you into the courts. Check this out. Luke 19, verse 39 and 40. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a colt of a donkey, the people shouted, Hosanna. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus answered in the biggest flex move ever, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Jesus says, I would tell them to be quiet, but you would still be offended because the earth itself would praise my name. This must be that the natural response to the Savior coming into our environment is praise and worship. So can we understand that God doesn't need yours or ours because the earth itself is longing to do it? The earth begs Jesus, let me praise you right now, Father. Let me praise you. I can tell you the waters want to be walked on again. Because the second Jesus stepped foot, the DNA of the liquid changed, and it became solid ground for our Father to leave his imprints upon. He's so good like that. Jesus doesn't need your worship, but he does long for you. He wants you. My wife went to Cambodia two years ago, and she came home. And my boys missed her a lot, and they were waiting at the airport for her. And as soon as she walked through that gate, after Parker got in trouble by security for throwing balls. <laughs> as soon as she walked through that gate, man, they ran and they hugged mom and they embraced and they just held her so tight, right? That's what she wanted. But what if my boys went to their mother and they said, we missed you, you're a good mom, and then walked away? She doesn't want to be told the facts of what they think. She wants my boys to express their feelings to her. Father God's looking at you in this place. He wants you to express your feelings, and I understand that it's hard. Trust me, no one 
is more equipped, you could say, to preach on worship than me because I'm the guy that used to say I'm not a worshiper. I remember being a teenager and getting mad at my dad when he would leave my radio on Caleb. I'm talking it was that bad. Because worship wasn't something that I did. It's not who I am. And I remember the first time I started to engage in worship. I started getting this pulling on my heart. I'm like, this is weird. And I was having this argument in my mind. Worship is what the weird people do. You're not weird. I'm just being truthful to you in this moment. Can I be real? I'll be real with you guys. And so I'm having this argument. Don't raise your hands. That's what the weird people do. But then something hit me. But what happens if you do? But what happens if you do? And it was just this argument. And finally, it just got to this point where I just had to do it. And I raised my hands for the first time in my life. The first thought that came to my mind was I've been missing this for so long because I just want to do this. It is not the raising of the hand that carried the power to pull me into presence, but it was the surrender of my heart, that act of laying down that, God, you are worthy. Maybe you've heard the phrase, a sacrifice of worship. How could worship be a sacrifice? Well, in that moment, I was sacrificing the false sense of identity that I put on myself that worship wasn't something I do. I was sacrificing maybe what other people might think about me, right? I was sacrificing all these things, these false identities and labels and distractions in that moment just to take notice that, man, I've got to get to the courts of the Father. This brought me to think of something else. Could someone be worshiping God charismatically with their bodies but still lack an inner conviction? Yes, of course, because it's really all about the heart. It's not so much... Right? Your heart has a responsibility. Your body has a responsibility, I could say, to reflect your heart. But you could be going through the motions charismatically but still never engage with the lover of your soul. My point with making the statement is this, is that everybody is different. And only God knows the intention of your heart. So everyone's worship will be different. So we are never to judge anyone else's. But there is a type of engagement that takes place in intimate conversation. If my wife is wanting to have a talk with me, right? Brothers, we got to figure this out. When I'm talking with my wife, she's listening to so much more than just my words. If my wife's speaking to me and I say, yes, no, maybe, well, she's not going to appreciate that. But let's say I take it a step further and I'm speaking to her in complete sentences, right? She's listening to more than just my words. She is listening to me with my eyes. She's listening to me with my body language. Am I distracted or am I engaged? Am I pulling away or am I leaning into her? The Father's looking at you. He's saying, where's your heart? Because the words are powerful, but your eyes are distracted. Because you're saying the right thing, but you're not leaning in into my presence. There's a type of reflection that must take place. And so, yes, everyone is different. But we are all wired with a desire to praise and worship. Technically, we all worship something. Is it not common for us to cheer for our sports team or to clap at a game? It's very normal for us. We all do it. And the question we must ask ourselves is if we are getting louder for a youth game than we are for a worship set, must I examine my own heart and say, maybe I'm having a hard time expressing my feelings to the king of kings. You see, worship or failure to worship has always been something that's viewed as a lack of surrender or submission, which this is true. It does take submission and surrender, right? We discussed this. you got to lay down what you think, what other people think. You've got to have a hunger that i got to experience those courts. But it could be something else. It could be that we've misunderstood. That maybe we think we're bringing God what he needs, but I'm hoping that through this message you're beginning to discover that what he really needs is your heart. His presence transforms our life. He takes what was broken. He makes it whole. He took my anger and gave me joy. All of my life that I've been living for the past four to five years has shifted from the courts. My salvation was set. I had given my life to Christ. That was set. But the transformation for me here on earth now took place in the courts of the Father. Worship cultivates an exchange. It does. I think that we could all agree that God is the most extravagant giver. What do we do? We give God our tithe. What does he do? Opens the floodgates of heaven. That's insane. Like, I'll give you 10%, God, and he's like, yeah, I'll open the floodgates. They gave Jesus two fish, and he fed a couple of thousand. So if extravagant giving is the nature of Jesus, then there must be something we as the body receive in return through worship. I bring you my praise, and Jesus says, yes, but I give you the courts. I give you my presence. 
His presence is everything. And right now in this moment, you guys, the, the point of this message, this word, I want you to understand and grasp this. I am not trying to get a congregation that fully sells out in worship. That will be your natural response. I want you to engage with the lover of your soul on a daily basis. For me, this is just don't take this, this is my personal application. If I have 45 minutes to spend with God in the morning, it is more beneficial for me personally to spend 30 minutes in worship and get to the word after. Why? Because I've been in the courts. And once I've been in the courts, I read his word differently. I understand at a higher level. The impartation is easier to receive because I was transplanted from my seat in that little room into his courts. If we could get this, I don't want to speak without presence. I don't want to move without it. And so I have no idle time. And so if I'm driving to Walmart, it's worship. If I'm going to get the kids food, it's worship. Because every word that I say and every action I display must be a byproduct of what I experience personally in the courts. Man, I stood in the gates for so long and I tried hard to be a good person. But trying will wear you out. You have access to an environment that costs you nothing but your sacrifice. And so why worship? Why worship? Man, there's way too many reasons to list. I would need a day. I would need a year. And I still couldn't. But here's a few. Write this down. Because he's worthy. He's worthy. Sometimes that's all we need to know. That's all we've got to understand is that Jesus, when I rejected you, you still accepted me. Jesus, when I went down a path that you didn't like, you never left my side. He's worthy. Psalm 145, verse 3, the Lord is great and so worthy of praise. God's greatness can't be grasped. He's so worthy. Number two, it's our identity. Engage with the scripture. Engage with the scripture, 1 Peter 2.9. Don't just listen to it, I want you to feel it. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Touching back to the beginning, who had access in the old covenant to the courts? Only the high priest. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you or a royal priest. God has granted you access. I love when the word backs up the word because I was reading just the other day and Revelations 1, 6 says this. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. Who made us a kingdom of priests? Jesus, through the cross. That cross was just not so you could stand before him and get into heaven. That cross was so that you could receive the Holy Spirit here and now. Jesus said his entire time here on earth, it's better for you that I leave. Because the one who is going to equip you with power is coming. It is Pentecost Sunday. The one who died so that you could receive his power is here with us now. Come on, give him a clap. Do it. Break it off. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Lift it up. Come on. Lift it up again. Lift it up all over again. All over again. All over again. Because he's worthy. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. You're worthy. You're so worthy. You're so worthy. You're so worthy, Jesus. You're the only one. You're the only one, Father. He's the only one. He's the only one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The final reason we worship is because it brings victory. Before I jump into that, as we close this message, let's reflect. Worship brings you in the presence. Psalm 100 verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving. I just got to take notice of his nature to get into this gate. But it's my praise and pure worship that pulls me into his courts. His courts transform my life and it will transform yours in an instant. It's a second. The second you step your foot into that environment, everything in your heart shifts. Number two. We're no longer misunderstanding what worship is. God doesn't need our praise, but he wants your heart. And in that response, you will naturally tell him who he is. Number three, he's worthy. Number four, it's our identity. And five, it's victory. So right now, we're going to look at a very specific passage of victory that's achieved through worship. Get this picture. King David has died. His son Solomon has died. Then his son Rehoboam became king. 
Rehobim is thine. Now Abijah is king. So we're looking at the great grandson of the man who wrote Psalm 100 verse 4. But things have changed dramatically since David was around. See, Abijah's father was evil and did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But Abijah is much more like his great-grandfather David than he is his own father. Right now, Abijah is going into battle. The only problem is he's outnumbered two to one. And so he goes in the battle. He has 400,000. The enemy has 800,000. But when you know your identity, you know what you have access to. Check this out. 2 Chronicles 13, verse 4. Abijah, the great-grandson of David, shouts to Jeroboam, listen to me. Don't you realize that the Lord, the God of Israel, made a lasting covenant with David, giving him and his descendants the throne forever? He's warning him, I know who I am, do you? Sometimes when Satan drops something off at your doorstep to battle, it's stress, it's anxiety, it's a financial burden. When he drops that off for you, you don't need to call somebody or post about it. You just got to remind him of who you are. I know who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm an heir to the throne, an ambassador of heaven, equipped and enabled by his strength. And because of this, I walk in his courage. Know your identity. Get it in you. You are not what other people say you are. You are not even what you've thought about yourself, but you are everything that he says that you are. I love that we sing child of God today. I love that we sing that song. Second Chronicles 13, 8. He says, do you really think you could stand against the kingdom of the Lord? He's just reminding him once again, here's what's happening. He's saying all this, and at this time, Abijah is telling him, I've been faithful, you have it. My people worship God, you worship idols. As he's doing this, he's being circled by the enemy. In this moment, he is completely surrounded by his enemy. He's surrounded, but remember, he knows who he is. Check this out. He's speaking, and he realizes what's taking place. His people his family, everything. The bloodline of David is surrounded by an enemy. They could be destroyed in that moment, and what does he do? When Judah realized they were being attacked from the front and the rear, they cried out to the Lord for help. The priests blew the trumpets, and the men of Judah began to shout. Let me say that three times. The men of Judah began to shout. Last time I said the men of Judah began to shout. At the sound of their shout, the enemy is defeated. They didn't fight. They didn't have to stand up for themselves because the king of kings stepped in and made a way when they were outnumbered two to one. Sometimes you need the king of kings to come in and make a way for you. Sometimes a doctor gave you a report that is not possible to get through by any type of medication. You need the king of kings to come through and make a way for you. Sometimes there's a relational break that's so bad you don't know if you could ever get back to that point with the person. You need the king of kings to come through and make a way for you. Sometimes you've gone through a traumatic life experience and you think that you've been changed forever. But Jesus says, I'm the healer of all and I want to touch your mind. I want to touch your heart. I want to rearrange the things in your mind that have shifted out of place and alignment. You've got to lift up a shout of praise in the room. The sound of their battle cry, God defeated Jeroboam and all of Israel. It says, after this moment in 2 Chronicles that Abijah grew more and more powerful. He continued to grow because once you've entered the courts, you don't stop going. It's always new. It's always more. The kingdom of heaven advances, moves forcefully through you, through the worshipers. And so right now, I want everyone to stand up. Everyone stand to your feet. We're going to close this out a little different. The king of kings is in the room with you, and I want everyone right now to close your eyes but I want you to open your hearts. And in your own mind right now, I just want you to begin to remember what the Lord's done for you. Just remember, just just begin to thank him what he's done for you. Now, sometimes in life, things are experienced, victories achieved in the secret place. But other times, it's only through the proclamation of your voice that victory can be realized. And so right now, I know it's new, but I want you to tell God your thankfulness. Begin to tell Him audibly. Come on. You should hear yourself speak. You should hear your spouse speak. You should hear the section over you speak. Tell Him you're thankful. Tell Him you're thankful. Tell Him what has He done. 
Thank you, Jesus, for my family. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Swing wide the gate. Thank you for the cross. Open up the door. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Let the King come in. We're so thankful, Father. Swing wide the gate. Thank you for healing Tiffany's son. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let the King come in. Thank you for healing Tyler's mother. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Swing wide the gates. Open up the door. Let the King come in. Our hearts are yours. Swing wide the gates, open up the door, let the King come in. Let the King come in. Let the King come in. Let the key enter his gates right now. Come on, enter his gates. We're so thankful, Jesus. Let the king come in. 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 Let Him come into your heart. Let the King come in. Roll out the red carpet for Jesus to your life. Let the King come in. Let the King come in. up one voice to our God we lift up one song to our God we lift up one sing it all together sing hallelujah to our God we lift up one voice to our God we lift up one song to our God we lift up one voice we're singing hallelujah to our God we lift up one
can't stop. This is new, but we can't stop because there's more. I'm sorry, but there's more. There's more. We can't stop now. Come on. The King of Glory's in the room. The King of Glory's in the room. access to this place 24 7 this is not a one-time deal this gates open to you at any time with a thankful heart and his courts are always ready for you to enter into with pure praise and worship that flows from your heart I don't want to end this moment right now if there's someone here today and you have never asked the Lord and Savior to become king of your life if that is anyone here right now and you don't know for certain you have wondered is my name in the book of life don't go another day wondering don't go another second. If that's you and you want to give your life to Christ, you want to know for sure. Is there anyone here? Raise your hand. Anyone here? Awesome. Then I just want to release a prayer over you guys. Today. Oh, I see you in the back. I see that hand in the back. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The angels are rejoicing in this place with us. We're not alone. And so if as a body, repeat after me. As we celebrate the one, because Jesus said, I will leave the 99 for the one. And this morning, he came for the one. And so let's just repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Take my life. It is yours. In your name I pray. Amen. And last time, come on, give him a clap. You are equipped, you are enabled to go into the environment of Kingfisher and release the King of Glory into your space. Amen. And so worship the King, worship the King, get into his courts this week, and whatever you will release will be a byproduct of what took place in that environment. I love you guys so much. You guys have a great week, and whoever finds God, 